You can draw a direct line between what Martin Dyes and his House Un-American Activities Committee did in 1938 to the decision of Ron DeSantis in June of uh, 19, 2024 to eliminate all funding for every cultural organization in the state of Florida, even though the legislature had just promised that money to those organizations. This is CBS Eye on the World. I'm John Batchelor. It is April 14th, 1936. It is chilly enough to wear an overcoat. Gathering at the Lafayette Theater at 131st, 132nd Corner, 7th Avenue, Harlem, is an excited crowd wearing fedoras, and some people are in fancy dress. There was also a vehicle pulled up with a motion picture camera on top taking this as if it's the launch of an aircraft carrier. There are mounted police present. The crowd is excited and all looking at each other, looking at the opening of the doors. This is the premiere of a Macbeth by William Shakespeare. It says so on the marquee. The Lafayette Theater has been here since 1913. It's been the scene of many gatherings of excited theater coders, but nothing like this. What is most striking to see the photographs today, they're everywhere, is that it's a black and white crowd together, and this is 1936, and that in itself is an achievement. I welcome the author of a book that explains that scene and so much more, The Playbook, a story of theater, democracy, and the making of a culture war by Professor James Shapiro. He is the Larry Miller Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University. And he's going to take us into that moment and then we'll roll back a little bit and where it starts and we'll roll forward a little bit and say how it's with us today. Jim, a very good evening to you. Congratulations for the playbook. That moment, those photographs, they're everywhere. What do you see when you look at that moment in history? Good evening to you, Jim. Good evening to you as well, John, and a pleasure to be speaking with you again. When I look at those incredibly vivid and powerful images. I think of one of the great moments in the history of American theater. I think of it as one of the great moments in Harlem's history. I think of it as well as one of the great moments in the history of Shakespeare in performance, all rolled into one. And there are thousands of people gathered in the street, as you said. There's a marching band playing. Uh, the advanced publicists were not allowed to spend money publicizing the production in print. So they had taken chalk and marked up every street in every direction leading to the theater uh, the previous day. And the crowd was gathered to see a production by an untested 20 year old director with a cast of 150 black actors playing Shakespeare's great tragedy, Macbeth. No one knew how this would turn out. Everyone was eager. They had heard the noises and the, and the drumming from the theater for weeks, for 11 weeks before this. So there was great excitement. And as you said, they were both blacks and whites. This was also uh, a great moment in the history of integration of blacks and whites in America as early as 1936 in an age of Jim Crow. Harry Lloyd Harry Hopkins, born 1890, died 1946. Immediately, everyone recognizes, oh, that's FDR's legs. That's the man who goes to Moscow. That's the man who transfers an enormous amount of material to the Soviets to fight the Second War. No, it's, right now we're meeting Harry Hopkins as a man who worked for Governor Roosevelt uh, when the when the depression hit in New York and then moved to Washington to also work for, for now President Roosevelt with what becomes the work, Works Progress Administration, although it started out as with other names. Inside that, Harry Hopkins vouchsafes, vouchsafes hurry up, urgency. Uh, this is our hour. And in particular about one part of the relief that the Roosevelt administration will follow through because it had started under the Hoover administration. 
is Federal One. What was Federal One, Jim? Federal One was a way of putting artists, and under that rubric, I would include painters, historians, actors, writers, and musicians, putting them to work. Harry Hopkins is one of the great forgotten Americans, and he deserves far more credit for helping this country in an hour of need. He was one of the very few men who were trained as a social worker in the 1920s and early 30s. And when the Depression hit, he had worked for the Red Cross. He had worked in New York State. He'd worked on a large scale. And he understood that if you put people back to work, you had to put them in work that suited them. In other words, you don't take a violinist and put a pickaxe and a shovel in her hand or his hand and say, dig a ditch. You put a fiddle in their hands and you said, entertain your fellow Americans. And by the time he got to Washington and had been put in charge of the WPA by President Roosevelt, he had understood how to make this work on a large scale. Federal One was an opportunity to create five organizations for musicians, for painters, for theater artists, for writers, and for historical researchers, and put them to work. And the jewel, uh, uh, the crown jewel of Federal One was the Federal Theater Project, which employed at its peak 12,000 theater workers, actors, directors, stagehands, and the like. We need to establish also something that there's a tradition of theater that's been lost here in the 21st century. And you spend a deal of time talking about the theaters across America before Hollywood uh, and before the big push of Hollywood, which ca happens after the first war, after the end of the Great War. Uh, that Those theaters, were they empty by the 1933, 34? Was it, was it a wasteland, Jim? It's hard to imagine today an America in which every town, small or large, held theaters. I'm talking about states like Nebraska, um, Montana, states that right now might have one or two theaters, had scores of theaters at the end of the 19th century. Theater was the American pastime in the late 19th century. And in the early 20th century, it peaked and movies took over. And by the 1930s, the triumph of Hollywood was almost complete. All those small town theaters had been turned into movie houses. All those local theater groups, which were kind of cultural glue that held communities together, uh, had been destroyed. The movies were less expensive. They had their own stars and they swept America. And by the time the 1930s came around, the number of unemployed actors was enormous. Actors could no longer work unless they were lucky enough to be in Hollywood. Even a large percentage of Broadway's theaters were shuttered and dark during the the height of the depression. So these were dire days for anybody who wanted to go to theater or create theater. And now Harry Hopkins has a choice. He needs somebody to direct the federal theater program. And his first choice, Alma Rice says, no, but I've got an idea. Introduce us to Hallie Flanagan, Flanagan, born 1895, also a Grinnell graduate. Who was she, Jim? She's the real star of my book, somebody I knew very little about until I was able to read her great book, Arena, which is about the federal theater, and also go up to Vassar College, where her archives are, read her, um, basically her diary or her memoir that remains unpublished, and uh, understand her relationship to Harry Hopkins. They were at Grinnell at the same time. And Harry Hopkins didn't want to pick a, a New York producer or a Hollywood type to run this federal theater. He knew Hallie Flanagan. He knew that she was a professor 
Ad Vassar, one of the first women to win a Guggenheim Prize. She had gone abroad in the late 20s to study theater in Europe, had gone everywhere, had met everyone, had gone to Scandinavia, England and Ireland, Germany and Italy, and especially Russia, where there was very exciting theater work being done. And she came back greatly excited, set up an experimental theater at Vassar College, and if Harry Hopkins had not picked up the phone and called her, probably would have spent the remainder of her life as a tenured professor training generations of Vassar women to go into the theater or to make theater part of their lives. But Hopkins called her up, uh, said, come to Washington, I wanna to talk to you. Uh, she reached out to everybody she knew in the theater. Elmer Rice was the only one who gave her advice. She went down to Washington and Harry Hopkins said, I'm asking you to direct this federal theater. N no, no one could imagine what a federal theater was. There was no federal or national theater in America. Everything was really uh, individual and nothing had been supported by the government until this time. And what Harry Hopkins and the Roosevelt administration had committed themselves to was considering the arts, much like industry or agriculture, as deserving of federal support. Many no longer think that, many are violently opposed to that in our own America. But in the 1930s, that was a consensus view. And it allowed both Republicans and Democrats in Congress to authorize federal one and to set in motion the creation of a federal theater. But nobody knew at the time how many unemployed actors there were in America, where they were, whether you could recreate in various parts of the country what had been so vibrant just decades earlier. And it turned out that you could do so in 29 of the states. So Hallie Flanagan set about in a matter of months to employ 12,000 theater workers, set up theaters across the nation, and get in gear. A th what would amount to, in the short four and a half year life of this theater, 10,000 productions in these 29 states, seen by one out of every four Americans, which is mind boggling to me, who paid a pittance or nothing to see these plays. And it wasn't just in theaters. There were, there were trucks that pulled into uh, uh, city parks and started staging plays there. They sent performers to entertain those who were digging trenches, who were building trails in Colorado, who were immigrant communities who needed plays in German or Italian or Spanish or Yiddish. This was a massive enterprise. The book is The Playbook, a story of theater, democracy, and the making of a culture war. We begin with that image of Lafayette Theater on 7th Avenue. Now, there are two names that are important here. The first is Rose McClendon, who's a star at the time, working Broadway. And she is involved in, at this point, imagining what the Lafayette Theater rented by the Federal Theater, uh, the, the Federal Theater program run by Flanagan for $1,800 a month, I believe. What can happen there is the play of Macbeth. And she knows somebody named Jacques Hausman. Uh, Jim, who is Rose McClendon? Who is Jacques Hausman? Before we introduce the play. It's almost a play within a play, to tell you the truth, John. Um, the personalities are all larger than life. One of the, the goals Hallie Flanagan set for the Federal Theater was to develop Black talent. And you, you couldn't be a, a Black usher in a New York Broadway house. So this was revolutionary. And the Federal Theater under Flanagan established what it called Negro units from Hartford, Connecticut to Seattle, Washington. And these were intended to allow Black actors and Black directors to create plays and to reach communities really underserved by theater. And the great, great 
Theater, the Lafayette Theater in New York City, in Harlem, was chosen to be the site of New York City's uh, Negro unit. The person Hallie Flanagan asked to be in charge was uh, Rose McClendon, who was a star of the stage, but also a director in her own right and the perfect person to develop talent. She knew everyone and she had worked with uh, all the leading black artists and many white artists as well, including Jacques Hausman, who was soon to be rechristened as John Hausman and soon to be known as one of the great producers, but at the time was a down on his luck, uh, illegal alien who had gone bust during the depression as a grain speculator in South American uh, commodities, decided to shift gears, enter the theater, didn't go so well, but Rose McClendon realized it would be useful to have a white administrator involved even in the, the Negro unit in Harlem, brought him in as a kind of executive figure. She was supposed to play Lady Macbeth in this production, but she took ill. Uh, the best guess is she, she had advanced cancer and she would soon die. Houseman, seizing the opportunity, seized her job, elbowing others out of the way, and brought in a protege he had been working with uh, at the time. Uh, he had seen a 19-year-old uh, perform uh, in a Shakespeare play in Romeo and Juliet, was struck by his talent, and asked him to direct the first play in the classics wing of the Federal Theater in Harlem. That young man was named Orson Welles. He had never done anything professional uh, on Shakespeare until this moment. You can't make this stuff up. The Playbook, a story of theater, democracy, and the making of a culture war. The scene that we opened with, opening night, premiere night in Harlem at the Lafayette Theater. Uh, 11 weeks before, Orson Welles, a very young man with that voice. He's doing radio work during the day, spending his money on taxis, food. I think he spends his money on the head of Macbeth. Yes, he does. The grisly head of the Macbeth. But he's got a megaphone at night and he's yelling at the cast all the time, do this, do that. Because his wife has had a genius idea that they're making lighting for and building sets for. It's Macbeth, but... It's Macbeth with an all-black cast, and therefore it's voodoo Macbeth. Asadada Dafora is now an important player because he brings in the cast, the African-American cast, that will fill the stage. And there are photographs. I urge everybody to look at it because it's quite magical. Jim, Wells at the time, he saw that the history of Macbeth was that it had been wearing out its welcome because nobody believed in witches. And therefore, the substituting of voodoo for witches is magical. But still, you make a fine philosophical point, and I'm, I'm taken by it, Professor, even though it's not part of our chronology. Is Macbeth a victim of the witches, of the curse, or is he a victim of his own weakness? Can we tell? And is that a tension in Macbeth that was solved by voodoo Macbeth? The first thing you have to realize is how novel it was to update Shakespeare in this way, to have what we now call modern dress performance and to locate this in 19th century Haiti. That just wasn't done. There had been a production of Macbeth virtually every year from 1900 till 1935 on Broadway. And every one of them was traditional. You, The Scots wore kilts and plaids and everybody looked like they were from uh, medieval Scotland. This was different. This was suiting the action to the word, the words to the action, and having uh, this reflect the revolution in Haiti that so captivated uh, American political theorists and the American people. So... The idea of bringing in Asadata de Foro's troupe, which were a really popular drumming and African chanting uh, group, allowed for a different emphasis. 
And as you say, the, the, the $64,000 question, as they once said, uh, about this play is, where does the evil come from? Does it does it come from Macbeth himself? Is it triggered by the witches? Is it instilled in him by his wife? Are there larger cultural forces that are producing this evil? And Wells, who had been to Nazi Germany, felt the currents at the time and the rise of fascism felt that it would be useful to have the evil as this larger cultural force operating in the play. So he did a number of things like make the role of Hecate and, and the witches far more central to the story. And in a sense, ended it with this is likely to continue into the future, a future of dictators, a future of tyranny. So it was a very cutting edge production the fact that a 20-year-old-ish white young white guy is shouting directions through a megaphone at his cast of 150. At one point, I think he kept them for 72 hours in the theater, only allowing for naps. Equity today would have him arrested and, and probably kicked out of the theater business. But this was a different world. And Wells was not going to miss his shot. He knew this was a chance to make his name, Houseman as well. And when that opening night in Harlem came and Wells basked in the applause that went on and on and on, in later years, he told a reporter, Macbeth was the greatest thing he ever did. And it was such a hit that it moved from the Lafayette Theater to Broadway. And then Hallie Flanagan had the inspired idea of sending it on the road, sending it to St. Louis and Detroit and Indianapolis and all the way to Dallas, Texas, in uh, a state where Blacks had no political representation and was breaking with Jim Crow habits and, and laws. So this was a, a political as well as a theatrical triumph. The reviews are very important to understanding of the moment because the reviews, the laudatory reviews, and there were one or two that were ironically cautious. But the, the laudatory reviews, always there is condescension uh, throughout their intending to recommend, intending to celebrate including Martha Gellhorn, who will go on to be one of the great journalists in American history, uh, sitting in the balcony, talks about looking at a checkerboard of blackheads and whiteheads below her. And Jim, the reviews at the time were all positive, except for a few holding back. And those holding back were concerned about this being a farce or in some fashion a send-up. How so? Explain that. American critics and American audiences, white audiences, were simply not used to seeing black actors play Shakespeare, period. And this was novel to them. And uh, we now live in a very different age where people will pay uh, a pretty price to see Denzel Washington play Othello next year on Broadway or even in the 1940s to see Paul Robeson. But this was the 1930s, and there simply was uh, no tradition of Black performers in America playing Shakespeare. The only African-American Shakespeare star, Ira Aldridge, had spent his entire career in England and on the continent. He never got to play uh, a leading Shakespeare role in America. So the reviewers struggled, some more successfully than others, to acknowledge what was brilliant about this production. But this is the 1930s in America. It's long before the civil rights movement. And even in the most liberal enclaves like New York City, you feel the uh, subtle racism creeping in. Langston Hughes, smart, very smart. But what about me? What's that, what's that referring to, Jim? The Black community had a very ambivalent relationship with the federal theater. Uh, many of the leading uh, figures of the Harlem Renaissance did not participate either as writers 
or as a uh, theater folk in in the writers project or the federal theater project and uh langston use uh while speaking to different constituencies at once praised the federal theater but also felt that the federal theater wasn't telling his story it was having black performers tell white stories for largely white audiences so what this play did was uh uh, changed the way people thought about race and interracial performance, but it also raised all the questions that we're still struggling with. Who should say what? Who gets to represent which point of view? What kind of plays should be done? And who should be doing them? And Langston Hughes faulted this for being unclear. Let's put it that way. Unclear. Unclear. Yeah. Is, uh, is this a Black experience? or African-Americans in roles that didn't suit their lives? This was an explosion, and the smoke had not yet cleared. And both Black critics and white critics wrote about this play. And if you want to take the temperature of where American culture was uh, on issues of race, just read the reviews of Macbeth in Harlem. Jim Shapiro is the author of The Playbook, a story of theater, democracy, and the making of a culture war. Sinclair Lewis, one of the great novelists of the early part of the 20th century, who's made a lot of money from Hollywood and made Hollywood a lot of money by 1935, writes a book very quickly in Vermont, which we know today is It Can't Happen Here. At the time, however, it was raw politics. And Hollywood snapped it up. Jim reports $200,000, which is the equivalent of $4 million today. That's a big number for a screenplay that's not written. It's a book. And the book is about a fascist takeover America. I don't have to fill it in. We've, we've seen lots of movies about that since. At the time, it was unusual. But what we learn is Hollywood couldn't handle it. Why not, Jim? The previous two novels that Sinclair Lewis had made had been mega hits for Hollywood, had pulled in millions of dollars. So that investment from the perspective of the Hollywood folk was uh, a very minimal one, considering what they expected the return on their investment to be. And they hired the best screenwriter they could to produce what would have been the great 1930s film about the rise of and threat of a fascist takeover in America. And Sinclair Lewis was married to one of the great journalists of his day who had interviewed Hitler, who came back to the United States, wrote a book about it. Uh, he's probably a little jealous of his wife and jumped the gun and quickly in Barnard, Vermont, wrote uh, in that summer, this extraordinary novel and setting in rural rural Vermont, uh, the story of what happens when uh, America elects a president who is going to strip rights from Jews and women and blacks and others and run America as a dictatorship. This was in the background of Mussolini and Hitler much discussed at the time. And no novelist, uh, whatever you think of him as a stylist, no novelist had his finger or her finger on the pulse of America as well as Sinclair Lewis did. The cast was hired. Men were growing beards for their roles. Uh, this was going to happen. And all of a sudden, MGM pulled the plug. And it wasn't until a number of decades later that it became clear why they decided not to do so. And Sinclair Lewis at the time just didn't know. He thought that uh, those in charge of censoring Hollywood films were behind this. But it's a complicated story in which uh, a leading Jewish rabbi in Philadelphia with connections to uh, Hollywood uh, begged them not to do this because he felt this drawing attention to 
concentration camps and the like would would be bad for Jews, which I think is a very mistaken attitude. Also, MGM didn't want to lose sales in Nazi Germany. They were one of the few uh, studios still selling films to to uh, Germany uh, after Hitler took power. So Sinclair Lewis, frustrated that his film had been pulled, received a call from Hallie Flanagan and her staff saying, could you turn it into a screen, uh, uh, turn your screenplay and novel into a, a theater script? And we'll not only stage it in New York City on Broadway, but we'll stage it in a way that will open across America in 20 cities on the same day, challenging what the movies did to us. We're going to show that we can do what movies do, open across the country simultaneously. And Sinclair Lewis said, you're on. He didn't ask for very much money. He was uh, not happy that the film had not been made. And one of the great triumphs of the federal theater Actors and directors and scene designers uh, went to work. Translators went to work trying to get this into Spanish and Yiddish. And on that same day, across the United States, with slight changes for regional variation uh, on in the setting and in the staging of this play, uh, this great warning about the dangers of fascism was brought to hundreds of thousands of Americans. A detail about the production. Working with Sinclair Lewis, you quickly discover you cannot work with Sinclair Lewis. Okay. This, this Everybody is should have This is a novelist. This is not a playwright. This is not somebody who works in teams. It's not, isn't somebody who goes to lunch. Good heavens. And they knew that, but they still took the risk. Hallie Flanagan uh did not have a big ego. And she knew how to deal with the many men around her that did. What she did was put both Sinclair Lewis and a, a script writer she brought in, in in different hotel rooms on different floors in New York City. And she would race between floors with their drafts, since at this point they were no longer speaking to each other, take it to the typist, come back, and then repeat and, and rinse and repeat until the script was in hand. The, the poor translators trying to get a Spanish script to the actors in Tampa, Florida, I think had a week to let the actors learn their roles for this play. But it worked and it opened everywhere. People uh, seeing the Yiddish production in New York City fainted at the concentration camp scenes. People for the first time in America really understood the threat of fascism. And I think it had a profound effect on uh, American attitudes towards Hitler, towards Mussolini, and after Pearl Harbor into entering the war. It was changed into three acts, 27 people. They had to limit the number of people because the book has many more. And it's a three and a half hour production, our Jim's reporting. What doesn't come through immediately, and I read it as a younger person, is that it's very funny. It has moments of great humor. I don't know whether that made it onto the stage because, as you say, they they tended towards the melodramatic. Is that is that where it still is, Jim? I think there are really are comic moments. Uh, uh, for instance, when the Gestapo-like figures come in and they see a copy of a, a Charles Dickens novel and start asking if this is propaganda. I think those moments made it into this stage production. But I think the federal theater drifted towards melodrama in part because they were terrified that local authorities might take offense. And in fact, they had to pull the production in New Orleans because uh, Yuhi Long had been a model for Sinclair Lewis. He had recently died, but there were proto-fascists in America and uh, there was a risk of pushback. And in fact, in Detroit, they had designed a beautiful uh, poster for this production. I included uh, a copy of it in my book. And it looked too much like Hitler uh, in the in the picture. And the word came out of Washington from Hallie Flanagan's staff. 
destroy that completely and don't go there because we're worried about Chicago's mayor. We're worried about local authorities pulling the plug on this. And that would have been a disaster. Uh, they skated between censorship and uh, uh, the hard truth telling. And I think you're right. They did steer towards melodrama as a way of avoiding political pushback on this. Uh, still, it was extremely well attended. It made a lot of money for the for the federal theater. Although I don't think that was their writ. They weren't supposed to be profitable, were they, Jim? They were accused of taking money out of the pocket of commercial theater, yeah. and they were accused of costing too much. So whatever the federal theater did, as far as their opponents were concerned, was wrong. They they weren't charging much. It might have cost a quarter or at most 50 cents to see this production. And uh, it was so successful across the country. Uh, Sinclair Lewis himself played in a uh, production of it. It was just a great American moment. I said earlier that the Macbeth and now this play have in it the vulnerability. The book is The Playbook. James Shapiro is the author. We begin with the two hits of the Federal Theater, part of the workers, the WPA program run by Harry Hopkins and led by Hallie Flanagan, the Federal Theater program. The hit Macbeth, Voodoo Macbeth, the hit It Can't Happen Here, Sinclair Lewis's novel. Watching this, and celebrating it, and at the same time waiting, are voices in Congress. Because there are many productions going on, and all of them have a, th a general theme of resentment of where we are in America. There's poverty, there's unemployment, there's bad housing, really bad housing. There's prejudice that we call today lynching. At the time, they didn't use that word routinely, unless they were threatening it, because they wouldn't move legislation to stop it. This is 1935, 36 through 39. Around all this are voices saying communism's a threat. That's right. The Soviet Union that would later be an ally against the fascists of Germany was seen as a threat at the time. And the original red baiter we need to introduce, his name is Martin Dyes. He's the son of a congressman, He's a member of Congress, and he's very ambitious. Uh, I welcome Jim to explain to us Martin Dyes. He's the, he's the story behind McCarthy. Who was he, Jim? Martin Dyes, as you say, was the son of a congressman. His father uh, had run and uh, served in Congress on a platform that was America First, anti-immigrant, anti-Asian immigrant in particular. He had uh, no love for uh, Easterners, for intellectuals, for what we would now call elites. And his son inherited all those values and one more, which was what we would call a deeply racist uh, and uh, Profoundly so. So when Martin Dyes ran for Congress for the first time, he used the N-word quite freely, knowing that he didn't have to win any black votes. There were no black votes in Democratic primaries when he first ran for office in the 18th, uh, second congressional district in, in Texas. Martin Dyes was six foot four, imposing physically, incredibly charming, would work through eight cigars a day in the course of a congressional hearing, uh, had studied drama in school, uh, spoke beautifully, eloquently, much as his father had. And he understood better than almost anyone else uh, who was a politician in his day how to take advantage of emerging media, especially radio. Radio had come really into American homes in a small way in the 20s, but it exploded in the 1930s, where everyone had a radio. In fact, the Federal Theater had radio programs that were listened to by 10 million listeners a week. Martin Dyes knew how to take advantage of that. He knew also how to take advantage of uh, newsreels. So he 
was desperate for power. And there are only two ways to gain power and notoriety in the 1930s as a congressman. One was to put in two or three decades. And at that time, if you were lucky enough to live that long, you would be given a chair of a consequential congressional committee. There was one other way, and he figured out how to exploit this, and that was to be in charge of what was called a special committee. A special committee was a very short-lived thing, and he tried to get to be in charge of special committees on various projects, and his colleagues in Congress thought he was a clown and always said no when he pitched these special committees. But a number of forces came together in 1937 into 1938 that put him in charge of a special committee for the first time. And those forces included the many Democrats, and Martin Dyes was a Democrat, who understood that FDR, President Roosevelt, was enormously popular with uh, Americans, but they didn't like his progressive policies. They didn't like the WPA. They didn't like Social Security. They didn't like all these things that were benefiting not just the rich in America, but the average American. And they decided to fight back by going at low-hanging fruit. Americans were beginning to tire of relief because the WPA was a relief program where you were given economic support to millions of Americans, either to build construction sites and bridges and dams, or on the other hand, to entertain Americans by painting, by writing, travel guides, by the great plays of the federal theater. Martin Dyes was put into a position and voted into a position of authority in Congress to be in charge of the first House Un-American Activities Committee. And during the debate uh, over this, and that exists in the congressional record, anybody can download that and read that today. It's quite chilling because his fellow congressmen kept saying, what's un-American? Is un-American anything you disagree with? And they recognize that if you created even a short-term special committee on un-American activities, this would move American political culture in a new and very dangerous direction. And Martin Dyes was put in charge of this, given seven months to file a report before his committee would end. And he understood that this was a fight for popular appeal. If he could appeal to Americans over FDR, over Congress, he could insist on sustaining the life of his short-term committee. And he decided to go after the federal theater. And in hearings that filled 500 column inches in two months in the New York Times and on more reactionary and right-wing papers, far more column inches than that, Barton Dyes decided he was going to accuse the federal theater of salacious and un-American and communistic fare that was uh, unacceptable and had to be destroyed. And uh, that was a battle that led to a great moment when Hallie Flanagan and Martin Dyes and his fellow committee members squared off at a congressional hearing in December 1938 and debated for the first and probably only time in American history, the place of theater in American democracy. We're going to get to that moment because there's vulnerability that is created from the plays that the federal theater puts on successfully between it can happen here and the end in 1939. The book is The Playbook, 1935 to 1939. And it is the federal theater that creates moments in that everybody resonates with. And one of them is what we call now urban poverty. But really it has more to do with the inadequate housing in the United States at the time for all the demographies, people African-Americans, Negroes were housed the worst, but the cities themselves were filled with unacceptable code breaking, something that no one paid any attention to. And 
the president of the United States after his election, I believe in an overwhelming election in 1936, ill-clad, ill-housed, ill-clad, and ill-nourished were the three that uh, FDR recognized. And the Federal Theater came forward with a project called One Third of America, and boy, did it get him into trouble. Did they know, Jim, that trouble was coming? Ali Flanagan had been so careful to push out of the program a handful of truly radical socialist, uh, extreme Marxists who wanted to do plays that attacked the Supreme Court and and attacked uh, mainstream American values. And she did push them out. But she thought by embracing what uh, FDR had spoken of in his second inaugural address as one third of a nation and the problem of housing, she thought this was a progressive winner. This was something that the average American would truly understand and brought together a great team over the summer uh, in Poughkeepsie, New York of designers and directors and movement coaches and actors. And they worked on this and produced one third of a nation. And it opened in New York City on Broadway. Uh, you can only imagine what it was like being in a theater in and watching a play that begins with a fire on stage, which is a, always a terrifying thing. And the set, of course, is a tenement building where there is a tenement fire and people suffer and die from it. This was one of what were called the living newspapers, which were fact-based accounts of problems in this case, real estate, and others of socialized medicine, uh, utilities, subjects that Broadway and Hollywood never handle. But the federal theater was bringing into the lives of everyday Americans. And this was a play that would move outside of New York and Philadelphia. They used collapsing houses, which was a problem in Philadelphia from poor construction at the time. Each part of the country where this play was staged drew attention to its own local housing problems. And of course, vested interests, real estate interests, moneyed interests uh, that had sway in Congress were not happy with plays that pointed out uh, who were the winners and who were the losers in uh, the American housing crisis. You've mentioned Martin Dyes, but this moves to the Senate. Very famous names. William Bora, uh, Robert Wagner, who is in favor of housing, the Housing Act of 1937, but, and James uh, William Byrd, James, William Byrd I've mentioned, Robert Wagner, Millard Tidings of Maryland. These are Harry Byrd of Virginia very upset by this, and it looks to be purposeful, making a message to the Congress that something must be done, and yet it's rejected by the Congress, and the, and Flanagan knew it. It was in the headlines, but the but the theater piece is too popular, so they don't pull it. They don't pull, they don't step back. The reviewers never mention it, but there's a small scene in which the senators you mention uh, are mocked on stage. And um, you mock United States senators at your peril. So they began to discuss and read from uh, uh and enter into the congressional record this mockery. Now, the mockery is using the very words of those senators. So here you have the senators reading their own words that they had already spoken in the congressional record into it again uh, through their attack on this federal theater play. But uh, this again was a way of attacking uh, the weak spots of Roosevelt's administration without going after the president directly. Yes, it's later in now 37 into 38. There was a moment where it appeared that the country was recovering and the federal spending slowed. And there was a second recession in 37 to 38. So the country's got feeling like it's going down again, making everyone sensitive and and 
uh, to any slight whatsoever. But the biggest slight of all that has not been dealt with so far is the treatment of the African Americans in the south of the country, although it's everywhere, but it's chiefly in the south, having to do with lynching. And Jim, I believe your reporting is that at no point was any play that was brought forward, produced by the Federal Theater, that went after the lynchings uh, that were so commonplace. But one big one you feature is Liberty Deferred, written by two young men, Hill and Silvera. Who were they? Abe uh, Hill, Abram Hill, and John Silvera were two very young and talented members of uh, the Federal Theater. They were both African-American. Uh, they were visionary. And they wanted to tell the story of the history of race in America. Martin Dyes, as a senior in high school in Beaumont, Texas, had witnessed two lynchings in his hometown that year. At this time, the Senate was refusing to criminalize lynching. There was just a strong Southern bloc that didn't want to open the door to legislation that would have eroded Jim Crow in America. So Helen Silvera, these young guys in their 20s, decided we're going to write a play together uh, and it's going to be fact-based. In fact, uh, they produced an eight-page bibliography so that every scene and every line in that play could be fact-checked. And this was going to be a history of racism in America that went back to 1619. We now talk about the 1619 project. These men were almost a century ahead. And they wrote a sardonic, funny, bitter, but truthful story called Liberty Deferred about the ways in which the liberties of African Americans had been deferred from the early 17th century until that moment in uh, the 1930s. And it included scenes such as one in which uh, a black man is denied the right to vote with doors slamming on him every way he turned. And what to my mind was probably the most brilliant scene in any federal theater play. And that was called uh, Lynchatopia. Lynchatopia was probably written by Silvera, or at least it was his idea. It's a very funny but brutal scene. And it's imagined as an annual January 1st moment where all the individuals, mostly black men, who have been lynched in the previous year gather in this heavenly site called Lynchatopia. And each one tells his story, how he was lynched. And there's a man who's recording their stories. And when he's told that this lynch victim uh, had a blowtorch used on him, you know, exclaims, are they going modern now, are they? And it's bitter and it's funny. And they all compete to tell the story of the worst lynching of the year and then have to go up against the worst lynching of, of all time. And it was a great way of telling the story. The problem for the federal theater, the problem for Hill and uh, uh, Abram Hill and John Silvera was their white supervisor was not happy with this play. He wanted to tell a story of slavery that implicated blacks as the cause of slavery. And he slow walked their script, sending it back time and again and again over a two year period so that Liberty Deferred was still not staged by the time the federal theater was closed by the American government. And it has never been staged since that day. You found, we have a minute, Jim, you found a manuscript that you can't be sure whether it's their original or whether it's the doctored manuscript. So there is no clear manuscript of Severa and Hill, is that correct? But there are four drafts that are all pretty close to their original intentions, and there's a fifth, and those are all in the Library of Congress. The fifth draft is in the New York Public Library, and that is an effort to try to appease their supervisor, and it's a sad script to read. Uh, Liberty Deferred was never produced, but... Do I say correctly that none of the plays that touched on lynching were ever produced? That's correct. Not a single one. 
And that was either witting or reflexive. Remember, Martin Dyes' committee, Professor Jim Shapiro, Columbia University, his new book is The Playbook, The Story of Theater, Democracy, and the Making of a Culture War. Voodoo Macbeth, It Can't Happen Here, One Third of a Nation, and Liberty Deferred to represent all the plays that were brought forward about lynching that were never produced. All of that is watched very carefully by the Dyes Committee. The Dyes Committee has a background, however, that's important to explore because the payoff continues for many decades afterwards. This is the House on american Activities Committee. The original version of this, remember this is a special in Congress, it has a finite writ and a budget, was by John McCormick of Massachusetts and a congressman named Dick Steen, I believe of New Jersey. Jim will correct me. Brooklyn. I'm sorry, Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan. Dick Steen of Lower Manhattan. And the trick here is that they were also setting up the idea of pursuing un-American activity. Were they successful, Jim? Dick Steen, Samuel Dick Steen, panicked uh, about the rise of Nazism. When you have rallies in Madison Square Garden, when you have thousands of neo-Nazis marching in New Jersey for uh, a man who was the son of a Russian rabbi born in Russia who had emigrated to New York and taken over a, uh, a house seat from Lower Manhattan, this was his obsession. Samuel Dickstein was really intent on getting Congress to investigate Nazism. What was only discovered in in fairly recent times was Dixon was also a spy for Russia, trying to take as much money as he could from that communist country and uh, Russia in turn hoping to infiltrate Congress. Samuel Dickstein he is a member of Congress who is spying for a foreign country who wants to run uh, a House special committee. But because he's Jewish and foreign born, McCormick uh, of Massachusetts is asked to chair that committee, initial committee. And when the Dyes Committee was established, it was largely because Dickstein kept pushing and pushing for a new committee, a large scale committee, and he was kept off that committee and Martin Dyes and others were put on instead. And the discovery was the Venona transcript. Is that that's how we found out? Uh, we did. We only found out decades later that uh, Dickstein was taking money and the Russians were very, uh, the Soviets were very disappointed in the quality of information he provided. Uh, Dickstein also was taking money from other foreign entities as well. Um, but this never came out in his lifetime. So there are stories within stories in the playbook, and you really can't make this stuff up. Uh, Dickstein attaches himself to Dyes Committee. So back to the Dyes Committee. They've decided now to focus on the federal theater program. Uh, Jim's reporting, Dyes doesn't really know what he wants to do. He's asked for a $100,000 budget and going to hire investigators across the country. Uh, the House says, no, thank you. Gives him 25000 and maybe enough for two or three investigators. He does have access to the FBI. Whose idea is it to focus on the federal theater and not Hollywood? Because he tries Hollywood and he backs off. He tries Hollywood and Hollywood very cleverly treated him awfully nicely and treated Dye's family wonderfully. And Dye's decided, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, it would take another generation before McCarthy would go after Hollywood. Martin Dyes was very fortunate that one of the members of his committee had found somebody who had been hired briefly by Federal One and insinuated herself into the Federal Theater, even though she was not employed by it, and had uh, been given a job that allowed her to open and read Allie Flanagan's mail. Sure enough, she uh, created or found or imagined enough incriminating information or stories and was uh, put before the Dyes Committee. And Martin Dyes had 
no knowledge of Hazel Hoffman before this, but watching her testified, he realized, I have a winner here. And he decided not to let her be cross-examined, not to even ask what her actual relationship to the Federal Theater was, which was non-existent uh, or almost so, and decided to break with every protocol that McCormick and others in their special committees had kept by allowing cross-examination, by uh, uh, insisting that evidence be uh, challenged uh, before Congress and allowed uh, a series of accusations to be made against the federal theater. Meanwhile, Hallie Flanagan's superiors up to Harry Hopkins said, this is just a sideshow. Do not respond. We're not going to allow you to respond. And after months and months of hammering, they realized we have made a mistake. Uh, in fact, um, uh, FDR really discovered that he thought he could control somebody like Martin Dyes. And when he finally uh, attacked Martin Dyes on the airways, Martin Dyes attacked him right back. And he knew he had gained a huge following. Gallup was just created as a poll, polling site at this time. And Americans were asked, do you, do you want the Martin Dye show renewed? And overwhelmingly, three quarters of Americans who had heard of the Dyes uh, report. And Dyes was on the radio every week or so and was reaching tens and hundreds of thousands of American households. They wanted that show renewed and they got it. Allie Flanagan created the problem by being un, by being trusting and uncurious about Hazel Huffman's offer to work for her for nothing. Hazel Huffman came forward, and you describe her as matronly, came forward with a sweet presentation, I want to help you in the mail room. So she works for Allie Flanagan for about a month, I think you said, Jim, not very long, and then leaves suddenly. And she was in the WPA as a receptionist. Now, the detail here is that her husband was also receiving relief. And the rule in the 1930s was only one member of a family can receive relief. So Hazel Huffman was careful to make it ambiguous of whether she'd taken money or not. But she read her mail. And that gave her the credibility to say things that you couldn't disprove without looking at the mail. This isn't a digital age. And part of the testimony that Hallie Huffman, Hazel Huffman made, she was being led by the, one of, not dies, he wasn't there for all of it. She was being led by a man named Thomas from New Jersey, Arnell Thomas. Well, she read the names of the plays and said, they're all communists. I'll read them to you and see if you can... Imagine how this sounds like communism. How long, brethren, new masses, revolt of the beavers, case Philip Lawrence, one third of the nation, medicine, power, Professor Mottenlock, Monlock, I believe that's uh, a, a, a revelation of a college. There's no communism in any of that. What, what did they think communism was, Jim? I should say nobody on... Dye's committee had ever been to a federal theater play. So to choose a play based on its title is a dangerous thing. Revolt of the Beavers turned out to be a play in which actors dressed up as beavers and imagined a better world. And when the Dye's committee attacked this play, Hallie Flanagan defended it by bringing in the responses children had written, such as, this play taught me it's better to be good than bad. It was embarrassing to me to, to read the congressional record on these exchanges. But Hazel Hoffman figured out that the committee wanted to hear that these plays were communistic and that Hallie Flanagan, who had been to Russia after all in her investigation of European theater, was tainted by communism. Hallie Flanagan was as middle American as you can get. She was a mainstream FDR supporter, a progressive we would say today, but she was far from a radical of any kind. And uh, Hazel Hoffman was able to smear her without any challenge of any kind before the Dice Committee. 
Yes, and the newspapers, in a slow news month, it was hot, it was August, everybody's out of town. Finally, bit with Huffman accusing everybody of being a communist. The woman's obsessed. Uh, she's so good at it, though. I, I suspected she was an agent of someone, but it turns out, so far, she's not on the Venona transcripts, to my knowledge. Okay, not yet, anyway. The L.A. Times is the one I wrote down. Uh Red Sway Theater Project, a uh, committee told. that A conclusive headline in Los Angeles for Hazel Hoffman. I go now to how the Dyes Committee saw its work, but Dyes wants, it, he wants to advance himself. So he plays, as you say, he plays the media because he knew at this time 85% of the papers in the country were against the New Deal. And he took on his own precedent. Did that surprise Roosevelt that Dyes was coming after him saying that he was, what did he call, grossly misinformed? He accused FDR? Dyes was a kind of genius. He understood and put together the, the playbook we now think of as, as timeless. Uh, in attacking progressive uh, uh, ideas and projects. You can draw a direct line between what Martin Dyes and his House Un-American Activities Committee did in 1938 to the decision of Ron DeSantis in June of uh, 19, 2024 to eliminate all funding for every cultural organization in the state of Florida, even though the legislature had just promised that money to those organizations. So I call the book The Playbook because it's not just about those thousand playbooks that entertained Americans in 29 states. It's about the playbook that now is opposed to culture and the arts in America. And Hazel Hoffman played Hoffman played a huge role in that. And um it was very difficult for Hallie Flanagan to try to uh, turn the tide. She did testify, I believe, December of that year. And she exchanged, um, she dueled with them, thinking that that was enough. Was she an innocent or did she know she was in trouble? Did she know that they were coming for her? You know, I'm an academic, so I'm always sympathetic to academics. But she entered that room and thought it was a kind of shabby courtroom set. She didn't realize the political theater she was entering would be more consequential than the theatrical works, the theater she came from. And there were moments of high comedy in in, in that hearing. Uh, Joe Starnes uh, uh, read aloud a passage she had written about something being Marlowe-esque. And he demanded to know, is that Christopher Marlowe a communist? We need to know. The room exploded in laughter. Uh, it, I think it was the lead in his obituary years later when Hallie Flanagan explained that Chris Morala was the greatest playwright in Shakespeare's day next to Shakespeare. Th this was the, the nature of that exchange. And she failed to explain to the members of that committee how theater worked and why it was so essential to democracy and it haunted her to her dying day. The book is The Playbook, a story of theater, democracy, and the making of a culture war. James Shapiro, he is the Larry Miller Professor of English and Comparative Literature, Columbia University. I recommend especially The Year of Lear, the professor's book that we talked about many years ago, as revelatory, not only of English human rights, but of what we inherit in America, coming from a moment where Shakespeare entered into history. He's not outside worrying about witches in Scotland. He's inside looking at threats to the king. Right now, we're talking about whatever happened to people who threatened the king. That would be FDR. And I want to start with the villains. Martin dies. He serves and then tries to run for the Senate. Then he leaves Congress and he returned to Congress. Did he reflect on his moments as head of HUAC? Was that the high point of his life or... Did he ever write it down, Jim? 
no one knew it at the time when he was considered as a potential candidate for president in 1940, or at least vice president at that time. His name was spoken up. No one would have guessed that by uh, by the end of the war in 1945, Martin Dyes's career would be in the rearview mirror. And uh, he left probably because of a health scare, had left Congress, returned and tried to be returned to the House Un-American Activities Committee, which would last until 1975. But his fellow members of Congress would have none of it. They they thought he was a dangerous man. Uh, Joe McCarthy thought he was the greatest communist hunter of all time, but that uh, McCarthy was an exception. He... Um, Took, he left Congress, started writing for the John Birch Society, and suffered a couple of strokes and uh, died virtually unknown, but has left a profound impact on the political uh, nature of our country. Allie Flanagan went back to teaching, I believe, at Vassar. And then, she went, yeah, go ahead. And then she became ill, and I, I lose track of her. I think she died in 69. She went back to Vassar her husband, uh, her second husband, her first husband had died quite young. Her second husband died. Uh, she blamed the Dyes Committee uh, for his deterioration and death. She tried to take a job at Smith College. It didn't work out. She developed Parkinson's disease and felt um, and told friends that her life, everything had been a failure and uh, in a nursing home in her late years, was sure that the voices in the hallway were um, attacking her for being a communist. It's a very sad end for Hallie Flanagan. And I've left time here for John Houseman and Orson Welles so we can tell the, the Hammond story. It's back to the beginning. Hammond, who yeah. was unhappy with the Macbeth production, one of the few, and the scene is various from Hausman's point of view and Wells's point of view. Let's tell Hausman first, Jim. John Hammond uh, had lost his wife of 27 years, went to review that production of Macbeth at the Lafayette Theater, didn't realize um, how late the play was going to start because there was a musical interlude that preceded the play and playing black songs and the rest. And he had to file his copy that evening. That's the way uh, theater journalism worked at that time. So he had to leave before the play was over and was unforgiving. And um, he was in ill health at this time, desperately sad because of the death of his wife and died 11 days later. What what Houseman and Wells both decided to do was to imagine a story in which the members of the uh, Black uh, drumming company and voodoo uh, uh, experts uh, led by Asadata Defora put a voodoo curse on this uh, journalist who dared to criticize and uh, this production and and argue that this voodoo curse uh, led to his death uh, the day after his story was published. All of this has been shown to be a fabrication, but it tells you in a sense uh, how many showmen were involved in the story of uh, the Federal Theater, Martin Dyes on the one hand and uh, Orson Welles at the other extreme. And Orson Welles, late in the day, argued against congressmen who were trying to close the Federal Theater on the radio, showing them and telling them how wrong they were. Uh, the book is The Playbook. A story of theater, democracy, and the making of a culture war. Not till Jim's book did I know that the story Wells and Houseman told about Voodoo Macbeth was make believe. But it reminds me of another movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, and that is where we're headed. When fact replaces legend, print the legend. Jim Shapiro, <laughs> professor of Columbia University and author of The Playbook. I'm John Batchelor. 